Thank you all so much for joining us tonight. My name is Melissa Loriano. I serve as the programs manager for the DC Preservation League. For those of you who may be new to DCPL, we are a citywide nonprofit organization dedicated to preserving and protecting Washington DC's historic built environment. Um, I'd just like to take a moment to first acknowledge some of DCPL's top sponsors whose annual financial support helps underwrite public programs like this one tonight. They are Denton's, Douglas Development, Antunovich Associates, Atlantic Refinishing and Restoration, Buyer Blender Bell, EHT Traceries, and KCE Structural Engineers. Uh, many thanks to you all for your dedication to historic preservation in DC. I also wanna share some uh, brief notes about how our program is gonna work tonight. So please use the Q&A box found at the bottom of your screen to ask any questions. I will collect your questions and verbally ask them of our speaker after their presentation. And for those of you joining us on Facebook Live, DCPL's Executive Director, Rebecca Miller, will be monitoring the comments there and will pass along your questions to me as well. <clears throat> so with that, I am so pleased to introduce you all to today's guest. John DeFerrari has, was born and raised in Washington, DC and has a lifelong passion for local history. He has a master's degree in English literature from Harvard University and has worked for many years for the federal government. In addition to penning the popular Streets of Washington blog, DeFerrari is a trustee of the DC Preservation League and the author of three books, Lost Washington, DC, published in 2011, Historic Restaurants of Washington, DC, Capital Eats, published in 2013, and Capital Streetcars, Early Mass Transit in Washington, DC, published in 2015. His most recent work, 16th Street Northwest, Washington, DC's Avenue of Ambitions, is co-authored with fellow DCPL trustee, uh, Peter Sefton, and will be published by Georgetown University Press in February, 2022. So congrats, congratulations for that, John and Peter. And with that, uh, I'm excited to turn things over to John. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you very much for that introduction and a welcome everyone. Uh, uh, <clears throat> as uh, Peter mentioned in the chat, so maybe you all are having dinner, which is a great, uh, a great thing to do while I talk to you about DC's restaurants. Uh, we're going to do a kind of a little tour of some of the most historic restaurants. It'll talk a little bit about um, uh, uh, the restaurant themselves and, and maybe some comments about some of the buildings too. Uh, so the, uh, uh, oops, here we go. Um, so first off a quick overview here before we launch into them. Uh, these, these are some of the candidates for the oldest commercial DC restaurants in continuous operation at the same location. And there is uh, probably the, 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 the most likely contender for that very exclusive title is Martin's Tavern in Georgetown. It's been around since 1933. Again, continuously operating there at the same spot. Uh, not many others can say, uh, can say the same. Um, we'll talk briefly at the end about the Toddle House. It's a possibility, but I'm a little doubtful about that. I'll tell you why. Uh, and then there's several that uh, have been around but have had breaks in service. So one is the Occidental on Pennsylvania Avenue, had a big break in the 60s and 70s. Uh, then two on N Street, the Tavern Inn and the Iron Gate Inn, both had breaks in service, but they date to the 1920s. And then uh, longest restaurant in continuous service, but at different locations. There's another, another twist in the story. Um, and that's the old Epic Grill, which I'm sure everyone is uh, expecting to, to show up in the, in the list. Um, and then we're going to talk, we'll talk some of these from the 40s. We won't get to all of them. Uh, so they're sort of next in line. And what I'm not going to talk about, though, are the hotels, restaurants and hotels, because I sort of don't think they count as much, even though these hotels have been around a very long time. The Willard certainly um, in different incarnations in the same spot since the 1850s. Um, nevertheless, the restaurants in those hotels come and go, and they don't really have uh, continuity, so I'm sort of discounting them. Uh, but before we get into those, let's just start a little quick background on restaurants in general. How did they get here? Where did they come from? Uh, here is an advertisement uh, for, as you can see, Jean Prévost, 
or John Griveau, uh, who was a, a French chef, uh, came to the U.S. to to cook at the at the White House for President Andrew Jackson. And then uh, when he finished uh, his duties there, he he went out on his own and opened a restaurant, as you can see here in D.C. Now, when was this? This advertisement appeared in 1838. Uh, there were restaurants in the city even before that in the early 1830s. The first restaurant in America, probably, the first real restaurant in America was 1830 New York City. Two brothers uh, from Switzerland by the name of Delmonico opened a restaurant in New York City, uh, which uh, went on to great fame. And uh, that was the start. Uh, and uh, another quick note before we move on, you may be saying, well, why, why, what makes that the first restaurant? Were the people not eat out before 1830? Did everybody just eat in their homes? Well, no, they, they certainly did eat out in taverns and pubs uh, of various types, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, but they weren't restaurants in the modern sense. And restaurants is, restaurants are generally defined as being places where you can go and you can choose what specific time you want to to eat within or within a you know a range uh you get to, to choose what you want to eat there's i.e there's a menu that you can choose off of and you're served personally um, by a waiter and, and and usually have a private table so it's all about the customer experience to use a, a very modern term uh that's what defines restaurants before 1830 in the U.S. There weren't the everyone uh, uh, ate at taverns where you had communal meals um, and you ate whatever was was uh, thrown out on the table, and uh, and, and that was it. So um, restaurants were revolutionary. So uh, the um, um, well, I'm going to move quickly up to the modern restaurants that I mentioned, but I do want to mention a couple of highlights. One is here, the, uh, this is a scene inside the US Capitol restaurant. Now this restaurant opened, as it says there in 1858. So if you wanna be strict about it, uh, the Capitol restaurant is in, by far the oldest continuously operating restaurant in the city. It is in fact still uh, primarily in the same room on the house side of the Capitol uh, room H117, where it opened in 1858. So that's pretty impressive. And um, it is, it was in the 19th century, it was a very uh, prestigious restaurant. Uh, it was an, in a newspaper review called it one of the best restaurants in the union uh, in 1869. Uh, and, and they would have, uh, they would bring in famous restaurateurs from around the country to uh, to operate the restaurant. The, the one here is, is George Downing, famous uh, African-American restaurateur from Newport who, who ran the, uh, the Capitol restaurant from 1868 to 1876. Uh, so, okay. Um, moving through the 19th century quickly, uh, I wanted to, to stop for a second here at the Willard. I said I wasn't gonna do hotels, but here I am starting off with a hotel. So that's, you can't trust what I'm gonna tell you. Uh, this is a uh, just a, a quick glimpse of what uh, good restaurant eating was like. Uh, this photo um, Francis Johnston took in 1910 of the of the restaurant, the the, the main restaurant at the Willard, and it uh, gives you a sense of the atmosphere of, of dining at, at the time. Uh, good restaurants were were deliberately. Uh, uh, places that were refined and aloof and and impossible for common people to access and that was that was uh enforced through many different uh subtle uh social means you had the, the famously aloof waiters that would that would always be so hard to to communicate with the menus would be only in french if you didn't speak french you wouldn't be able to read the menu and order anything uh, there were no complete meals. You were you were expected to be able to assemble the different parts of the meal from the menu um, because you were supposed to have that skill. And and of course there was elaborate etiquette. So this was a very uh, exclusive kind of world. These these uh, good restaurants of the 19th century and that would all change in the 20th century. And we'd have a lot of different uh, new types of of things going on. And um, 
I'm going to start, I'm going to sort of go chronologically through some of these historic restaurants. So I'm starting with the Occidental. And that was, uh, you see here a, a photo, uh, obviously, from later on from the, the late 40s of, uh, of the front of the restaurant in, the, in this Occidental Hotel. It was uh, located, uh, still is located right next to the Willard. It was originally built by Henry Willard. Um, after his brother Joseph took over the Willard, he wanted his own hotel. So he, he built this boutique hotel next door and he leased it to a guy named Gustav Buchholz in 1912. And that's when uh, Buchholz opened the Occidental. And he was a, uh, he had been the head waiter at the Willard. He was very popular then. And so that he branched out. And this is a, this is a pattern of all, uh, or maybe not all, but lots of the, of the really great lasting restaurants in this city and, and in other cities too, that you've got a really strong personality uh, Buchholz in this case, uh, who drew people in and really built a following and made his restaurant great. And so the Occidental uh, became the, the kind of the first uh, power spot, dining, uh, power dining spot in the city. Um, it was a steakhouse that sort of set the trend of steakhouses in the 20th century. And um, it, uh, here's a, a postcard from the view of the inside of the original Occidental. And uh, it, it was a place for people to, to uh, see and be seen and for VIPs to, to have important uh, uh, meals uh, with each other. And uh, Buchholz started the, po the policy of putting up pictures, portraits of famous people who dined in the restaurant. And this quickly caught on and anybody who, who was anybody wanted to get their picture up. They all gave their pictures to Buchholz to put up on the walls. And you could see the portraits all along the walls here. Um, and so that was a tradition and that continues. And there are other, you know, our current steakhouses, um, some of them in the city still, still do things like that, do caricatures or portraits of people. Um, the, uh, the Occidental uh, continued on uh, after Buchholz's death, uh, his family continued it on. Uh, it started to decline as, as many um, institutions did uh, in downtown Washington in mid-century. Uh, the uh, people didn't want to eat downtown after in those years, the 50s and 60s. Uh, the restaurant declined quite a bit. Um, it went, finally went bankrupt and closed in, uh, uh, in 1971, and uh, they had a big auction. They auctioned off all the fixtures. They also auctioned off a stack of thousands of photographs. Fortunately, most of them are now in the DC History Center, so they weren't all lost. Uh, but uh, so it was shut down, and um, and as as many of you probably know, um, the uh, the the Occidental was was torn down, and and next to it, the Willard Hotel also shut down. For a while, but then it was uh, restored and reopened in 1983, and an extension was built on here so that they could recreate the Occidental or, or have a new incarnation of the Occidental right next to it. And so it has been the, the reincarnated, rejuvenated Occidental, opened in 1986 and has been there um, ever since. Uh, so, uh, so that's sort of that style that uh, a, a little bit coming off of the same style as, as that Willard um, dining room I showed you. But uh, this, was, uh, this was not the only thing going on in the 20th century. And if we go along uh, chronologically to our next site, the Tabard Inn, um, we're into the 20s now. Uh, so uh, a lot happened in in uh, 19, beginning in 1917 to the restaurant uh, world in DC, uh, because that was the year that prohibition took, uh, went into, into effect uh, in DC. And uh, prohibition um, just was devastating to many, many restaurants. Uh, a lot of the, the, uh, the famous restaurants uh, before that date went out of business, many, many of them did. Uh, certain types of restaurants uh, were able to thrive, however, 
And uh, in particular, one type would have been the, the tea rooms or tea houses, uh, which were a, a, real, a real fad in the 1910s and 1920s. Uh, so tea rooms uh, were, you know, they, they descended from an English model, but they became a really American style of, of, of uh, informal restaurant. They were, most of them, uh, aside from, well, there were two types. There were, there were tea rooms in hotels and department stores that were very institutional, and some people probably remember some of those. But then there were the independent ones, uh, like this one, the Tabard Inn that were uh, run um, uh, mostly by women. And they were an alternative to your traditional restaurant. They were tea room uh, meeting and afternoon tea, an informal meal, as opposed to the formal meals at a formal restaurant. And, uh, and you drink tea or, or, or a non-alcoholic beverage and, uh, and, and primarily by and for women. So, um, so they, they thrived, especially in, in the prohibition years that, that killed off the, the alcohol serving places. And here, um, the Tabern Inn uh, in particular uh, was opened by Marie Willoughby Rogers in 1922. She bought this uh, large uh, uh, townhouse on N Street near DuPont Circle and opened this place up. Uh, she kind of envisioned it as a sort of a party house and uh, it became very popular. Uh, a, a, play, a meeting place for, uh, particularly for women, but but everyone allowed in, of course. And um, this, uh, I won't talk a lot more about this particular place because uh, the, the DC Preservation League is going to have a, an event at the Tabard Inn for members later in the month, uh, so you can learn a lot more about it. Uh, but this, uh, uh, the Tabard Inn, uh, continued until um, uh, 19, uh, until the early 1970s, I think around, I think 1970 actually, uh, I was trying to just check in my notes on the dates here. And, uh, and then it was uh, closed through most of the 70s, but it reopened at the end of the 70s and has been in operation since then. So that was the break in service uh, for the Tabard Inn. Now, directly across the street, uh, from the Tabard Inn is the Iron Gate Inn, or was the Iron Gate Inn. And this here, you have a, a view, a, a vintage view inside the Iron Gate Inn. Uh, so what is this place and why does it have these odd looking uh, piers and, and railings and such? Uh, the, the Iron Gate Inn is actually the former stables that, that is behind the, a mansion on N Street. And that mansion uh, built in 1908 uh, was built by General Nelson Miles. He was the commander during the uh, Spanish-American War. And uh, Miles was a, was a great uh, horse aficionado. Uh, he loved his horses and he built a very extremely elegant uh, stable, stables for the, for the horses in back of his house. No one else would have done such an elaborate uh, building for a stables. Uh, and uh, in, the, in the early 20s, the mansion became the headquarters of the General Federation of Women's Clubs. And they decided to convert the stables into a, into a tea house or into a kind of a demonstration tea house. So uh, they did that and it opened publicly. Uh, uh, it opened in 1923. And uh, its proprietor, Marie Mount, was a, uh, a teacher at the University of Maryland. And uh, she used the she used the Iron Gate Inn as a as a, a teaching place for for uh, for how to um, how to open a tea house and how to how to serve in general. Um, so uh, the the Iron Gate Inn uh, it had several different iterations. Uh, after Marie Mount uh, passed away, uh, it came into the hands of uh, Charles Saw a uh, Palestinian born American who served a lot of wonderful uh, Arab cuisine at the place. Uh, it had several other um, owners as well. It, uh, it managed to keep running until 2010 um, and then uh, shut down. So it was, if it had made it, you know, if it had not had that break in the early 2010s, it would, it would 
clearly be the most, the longest continuously operating. Uh, but anyway, it did uh, come back 2013. Um, I, it, I think it's just called the Iron Gate now instead of the Iron Gate Inn. And, um, and now, you know, another fine restaurant there, not a tea house anymore. Um, okay, let's uh, next along our, our tour here would be uh, the old Ebbett Grill. And lots of people know the old Ebbett. In fact, I think this is the, the restaurant. Uh, when I ask people, what do, you, what do you think is the oldest restaurant in DC? People generally uh, think, or many people think the old Ebbett is. Uh, well, you know, it's complicated. Uh, it it kind of is and kind of isn't. Um, so what is the old Ebbett? The, the old Ebbett here, you see the original Old Ebbett Grill. It was a this this uh, lovely Italianate building, eighteen uh, seventies building that was on F Street, uh, specifically fourteen twenty seven F Street. It was just uh, um, two doors down from the Rhodes Tavern at the corner of Fifteenth and F. So Rhodes Tavern is just off screen um, to your left, and. Um, the old Ebbett was was uh, was the, the the brainstorm of uh, Swedish-born Anders Lofstrand, and he was an entrepreneur. And in uh, 1926, there was an old hotel down the street, down the next block, the other way, um, called the Ebbett House that was closing. The Ebbett House was a long-standing uh, Washington institution hotel had opened uh, in. 1856, uh, but it had gotten and it had been uh, re renovated and changed and altered in many ways. But by uh, 1926, it was really old fashioned. It was losing out to, to other um, newer hotels and the owners decided to, to shut it down. And, uh, and they did and, uh, and in typical fashion, they had an auction where they sold all the fixtures in the place. And so uh, Anders Lofstrom decided to buy some of the bar fixtures from the Ebbett House. He bought the, the bar itself from their, from their bar and, and some other items that had been uh, some other decorations. And he moved them over here to this building and he called it the old Ebbett Grill. Um, I'd like to know if there's a, if there's a intellectual property uh, uh, legal suit involved in him taking that title. I don't know whether there is or not. Um, there certainly would be if somebody did it today. Uh, anyway, he opened the, the old Ebbett in 1926. Uh, that's when it started. Uh, and it was a very informal place, not nothing like the Ebbett House Hotel had been. And uh, it, it was, uh, Lofstrom's aim was to provide good, simple food at low prices. Uh, uh, he pledged not to charge more than 10 cents for any one order. So a uh, very informal, easygoing kind of place. Uh, the old Ebbett stayed here until um, uh, it, it had, well, it had some drama. Uh, let's uh, see uh, uh, the next picture. Here's a picture, an interior of its current uh, location. And uh, actually, I'm getting a little ahead of myself because if we're if we're still back in in the townhouse, um, let's let's I change my mind here. Uh, so uh, after Lofstrom died, uh, this uh, restaurant also went through a couple different hands, and it was uh, by the mid mid century. Uh, this, this is a similar story as we heard about the Occidental. It was on on hard times, was not uh, making money, and in fact. Um, it was uh, seized by the IRS in 1970, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, for failure to pay taxes. And the IRS seized the restaurant and set up an auction to auction off all of the interior fixtures. And they, they had their auction and uh, were proceeding to sell them off one by one. And then there was a, a sort of a, a white knight came in and offered to beat all of the all of the uh, prices on on the entire lot, and and to buy the whole thing lock, stock, and barrel, and that was Stuart Davidson, the owner of Clyde's Restaurant in Georgetown. So that's how Clyde's got got the old Ebbett and rescued it from from oblivion. Uh, so that happened in 1970. It, it became 
part of the old uh, part of the Clyde's uh, chain. And then uh, let's go back now to this 1983 picture. This is uh, the restaurant moved around the corner in 1983 when uh, the original uh, building was torn down uh, along with Rhodes Tavern, um, you know, after a long, unfortunate saga there, uh, which would be a topic, a long topic of its own to talk about, so I won't go into it. But um, the restaurant is now parked behind the facade of the old National Metropolitan Bank on 15th Street, part of the Metropolitan Square complex now. There's only, the bank's uh, facade is the only historic uh, remnant left. There's nothing behind it that's historic. This is all uh, 1983 space. So, um, so there you have it with the old Ebbett. It's a complicated story. It's moved to different places. Uh, the old Ebbett, sometimes they used to at least have little cards claiming that that the restaurant opened in 1856 uh, because they were kind of trying to scoop up the whole history of the Ebbett House Hotel as being part of themselves, which to me is kind of cheating. So I think they date back to 1926, which is pretty old in and of itself. So, uh, so there you have that. Now uh, let's move on to Martin's Tavern, which I said, uh, I think is, is the oldest continuously operating in the same spot. Martin's is in Georgetown, as you can see, as you may have seen and been there yourself, uh, 1264 Wisconsin Avenue. This building, this is a charming building, uh, a little uh, 1869 corner store type building. And uh, uh, Billy Martin, who was a, a Georgetown native and a, a baseball uh, star player, uh, opened uh, Martin's in, uh, in April, 1933. Uh, and there's another uh, tradition there of sports players opening restaurants, which is, is, uh, is a, a theme that carries across, uh, not just in DC, but across the country. And um, so 1933, why is that important? Well, um, that's when prohibition finally ended. So Martin's was, Martin's had the first uh, liquor license after prohibition. And interestingly, there were, there were a lot of uh, finicky rules about, about uh, eating at Martin's when it first opened because um, Billy Martin wanted to make sure it was a respectable place and that all the bad things that people used to say about bars and taverns weren't going to happen at his place. Um, there was a strictly enforced dress code. Uh, women were not allowed to sit at the bar at all. Uh, men were prohibited from moving, from moving around. You had to be seated at your table and you had to stay there. So there was going to be no... Uh, no messing around in, in Martin's Tavern. And uh, it's kind of, uh, we, can, we can laugh at, at that sort of thing now, but at the time it was part of the effort to, uh, to make people feel comfortable with taverns reopening. So um, uh, Billy Martin was a, is a great uh, uh, host uh, for his, his, his uh, tavern and was very successful, very popular. Uh, everyone went there. Presidents went there. Um, every president from uh, Truman through Do George W. Bush dined at Martin's. Uh, Kennedy, uh, John F. Kennedy is said to have proposed to Jackie Bouvier in booth number three. So I, I think it's even marked if you if you go there now. Uh, and Martin's is, is uh, <clears throat> um, obviously still in business. Uh, one reason for that is that uh, the Martin family still runs it. Uh, Billy's grandson, also named Billy, is the uh, it runs the tavern to this day, and um, and that's that's a little bit rare. Usually, uh, restaurateurs retire; the restaurants close. Uh, sometimes their children will run uh, a restaurant, but often you get to the third generation and they're not interested, and the place closes. So Martin's is an exception that way. And uh, a key reason why it has, it wins the prize for longest uh, restaurant in one location. Uh, so let's move into the 40s now. Uh, we're, not, we're not setting any more records, but we're, we, we do have a lot of historic restaurants uh, around uh, from the 40s and 50s. 
the Florida Avenue Grill, uh, great place, wonderful food. Uh, it uh, opened, as you can see there, 1944. This is a, um, a, a rather humble building. Uh, it was built in 1916. It's on the corner of uh, um, uh, Florida Avenue and at 11th Street. And uh, the grill was founded by a guy named Carl Wilson, uh, native of, of Burlington, North Carolina, uh, who had uh, served as a waiter and, and uh, scrimped and saved for a long time until he had had $5,000 to start out on his own. He bought this, this place, uh, fixed it up, and, uh, and opened the Florida Avenue Grill. He opened it with his wife. He did the, 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 the front of the room, the, the cash, cash register and, and, uh, and maitre d', as it were, and uh, his uh, his wife Bertha was the cook in the back, uh, and there was the, the the grill got uh, got its reputation uh, much of it from taxi drivers who would stop here for a, a quick bite. It was open at all hours, and they passed the word. Uh, and they're very powerful and they're very influential. And uh, the grill has has uh, done very well ever since. Uh, survived the ups and downs of the neighborhood. Um, uh, through the disturbances of 1968 and everything else, um, and is still growing, going strong today. Um, a, a wonderful, uh, a wonderful place. And um, it's not. Um, I should mention um, this, the historic preservation status of some of these places. I didn't haven't been doing that. Uh, this one um, is not does not have any particular historic. Uh, status. Um, it's not under any threat that I'm aware of. If it were to be protected, it would certainly be because of the uh, the, the Florida Avenue Grill itself, the business, uh, probably not uh, for the building. Uh, now, here in contrast, in, in some contrast, uh, is a is a building that has recently just been uh, nominated uh, to and and designated as a historic landmark. This is Annie's Paramount Steakhouse on uh, 17th Street. And uh, the, uh, the Paramount Steakhouse, uh, the story there, uh, originally opened in 1948. It was opened by um, George Katinas, uh, son of, of, of Greek immigrants. Um, he leased a, a property actually about a block or so uh, south of here and uh, in, in 1948. And, um, uh, opened the Paramount Steakhouse. It was just a, a regular neighborhood steakhouse. And um, George's younger sister, Annie, uh, worked at the restaurant beginning in 1952. And she was the, she was the powerful personality. You know, I mentioned before that a lot of uh, great restaurants are connected with, with people that uh, often the owners who have really who are really charismatic and 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 generate and build up a community uh, of customers, and in this case it, it was it was Annie, and uh, she was a real favorite of of the patrons, uh, so much so that in 1962 George uh, added Annie to the name and it became Annie's Paramount Steakhouse, and uh, the key the key thing here what makes this historic is that. Uh, this was a, an early gathering place for the LGBTQ community, uh, and Annie was a was a really powerful person in making uh, making those people feel uh, comfortable, making gay men and women uh, uh, comfortable and at home and and able to uh, to openly uh, uh, eat and celebrate and commune in in the restaurant long before it was something that that uh, could be done in the open. Um, in the 50s and 60s, it was a real pioneering institution for that. So, um, uh, and that's the reason why it was uh, in December last year, uh, the Annie's was designated historic landmark, both this location that you see here and the original spot, uh, a block to the south, which is now JR's. Uh, so both are, both are landmarks. Uh, and uh, then we get, let's we we'll move into the 50s. We have to talk about Ben's Chili Bowl. Everybody knows about that. It's a Washington landmark. It says so right there on the front of the building. So 
That's what it's got to be. Um, it's actually, in, in, in my view, Ben's is kind of the, 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 uh, the, the epitome of, of a restaurant landmark because it is not only uh, a very historic restaurant, but it's a very historic building as well. Uh, so the building it's in, you can see it's quite a, a fancy little building. It was built in 1910 as the Minnehaha Theater. It's, a, it's one of the very uh, early first generation Nickelodeon style uh, theaters that, uh, that were in Washington in the, in the early days before they became, before the era of movie palaces and large theaters, uh, they were, there were these Nickelodeons where for a nickel you could watch a, 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 watch a film. Usually they were short films um, shorter films than the feature films that came later. Um, and this is, you can see this building, it's, it's a long building. It's, it's longer than most storefronts would have been built. So it was designed as a theater. And uh, it had many uses. It was a pool hall before uh, Ben Ali uh, purchased it in 1958, but Ben and his wife Virginia purchased it. Uh, ben just sort of quickly on, on Ben, of Ben's Jelly Bowl, uh, he was a native of Trinidad who came to Washington uh, to, to go to school at Howard University. Uh, and he, wanted to, he went to dental school. He was aiming to be a dentist. And um, his plans changed when uh, he had an unfortunate accident, fell down an elevator shaft, and um, uh, it, it kept him from being able to really to be a, a dentist. And uh, he had to find something else, and uh, he worked for a while at just down the street at at um, Ann's uh, Ann's Hot Dog Grill, and that's where he sort of learned the business of of hot dogs and chili dogs, and and burgers and etc. And so he uh, uh, he and and Virginia um, opened uh, opened Ben's Chili Bowl here in 1958, and it's been going strong ever since. Uh, also, another place that's famous for having survived um, 1968, the disturbances uh, along, you know, along U Street here and, and elsewhere. Uh, most other businesses after that, uh, many uh, certainly closed or moved away. Um, and then, uh, but Ben's uh, persisted, uh, stayed open. The um, and then it went, and then it went through another round of 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 depressed business uh, around 1990 when the uh, subway was built through on, on U Street and the street was all cut open all the way on, uh, to, to lay down the subway and uh, managed to get through that too. Once it was through uh, both of those, uh, it was, it was uh, famous and uh, been, been world famous ever since. Uh, let's see here. The, uh, I'll move on now to uh, the monocle. We've reached, gone up to about 1960. Uh, and here the monocle is a restaurant on Capitol Hill. Uh, you, might, you might know it. It's uh, uh, two, uh, two townhouses here. You can see one was built 1879, one 1880. They had been, uh, they're facing south toward, toward uh, Union Station. And uh, they had been a uh, restaurant, used for restaurants for, for many years in the early 20th century. And then in 1960, uh, Connie Volanos and his wife, Helen, opened, uh, opened the monocle here. And this became a, uh, a quickly became a, a lunch and dinner spot for, for Hill, uh, Hill dignitaries and, and other people too, and lobbyists and, and anyone connected. So this is right up on the hill. This is on D Street. I don't think I mentioned that. You can see in the background, uh, this is the uh, Dirksen Senate office building. Uh, so you're right up there on the hill. And uh, in fact, the, uh, this, the square that the monocle is located on is, is owned by the federal government. Uh, and most of it, uh, you can also see there, most of it is parking lot around around the monocle so um so there's another um historic preservation issue there what what eventually will come of this this restaurant at some point one imagines that 
the Senate will want to build something on this square, uh, another office building perhaps, or a parking garage or something. And we'll see, we'll see what happens to the monocle. Um, but uh, but uh, I didn't talk about the, the restaurant itself. It was, as I mentioned, it started in 1960. It, uh, here's a, an early look at the inside of the monocle. It was 1960, of course, was the election year uh, that uh, Nixon versus Kennedy. And Kennedy was a, uh, really loved coming to the monocle. He had his favorite uh, table right in the front window. And, um, and all other senators and congressmen were, were frequent guests as well. Uh, the, um, the, there's the, 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 the story I, I enjoy most about the Monocle history was uh, once when Lyndon Johnson came, when he was uh, a vice president in, in those years with, with Kennedy. And he came uh, one evening to discover that uh, no tables were available. The restaurant was full. And he asked Connie Villanos to get on the loudspeaker and ask whether anyone would be willing to give up their table for the vice president. And uh, Villanos did ask that and uh, no one volunteered. And uh, Johnson apparently uh, just stormed out in a huff and never came back. Um, but, you know, I wouldn't have volunteered either. So, uh, so I'm, I, I totally understand. The, um, uh, and, and the monocle, like many of the restaurants or, or a number of the restaurants right up there on the hill uh, was even has been wired and I think probably still is to to have the bells from Congress uh, ring in the restaurant so that members are there. They'll know when when votes are being held and they can they can rush back to the floor and cast their vote. Uh, so it's a real hill institution still going strong. Um, uh, it's now run by John Volanos, the, the son of Carney and Helen Volanos. So again, that's in the family. Um, he's a, a great host, uh, uh, as was his father and mother. And uh, that's, that's uh, a big strength of, of the monocle. Um, that's uh, as far as I'm going to go in terms of, of into into current time. So uh, 1960, uh, we've got, that's not that recent. So there are many, many restaurants since then. I do want to talk a little now about some of the places that uh, were restaurants. The buildings are still around. They're not restaurants anymore. And uh, particularly the little casual ones, uh, a lot of people I'm sure are going to remember the Little Tavern, uh, which was a chain in uh, throughout the, the area. Uh, and here's a place, actually this photo is out of date. It, it's now just called the Tavern, this particular one, uh, which is on M Street in Georgetown. And, uh, but let me talk about the history of the Little Tavern for a second. Uh, the Little Tavern was um, frankly uh, an imitation of the White Castle uh, chain, which began in uh, Kansas in, the, in 1921. So the idea of this, of this chain was that you would serve uh, little hamburgers, hamburgers cooked with onions, so they'd be very tasty, but they are, uh, and you'd serve bunches of them to people and they'd be cheap and, uh, and tasty and, and there you have it. And that was basically it. Another, it's, it's a fast food, pre-McDonald's fast food. Um, and they were often, the White Castle set up the system where they had little uh, little restaurants, prefab style restaurants, and uh, they were very successful and everybody imitated them. And one of the big imitators here in the DC area was the Little Tavern. And it was founded by Harry Duncan in, it was actually founded in Kentucky and Louisville in, in 1927, but Duncan moved to, to DC and opened the first one here in 1928. And um, as I said, it, this is a knockoff of the White Castle. He also had the little, little burgers. Uh, the White Castle had a motto, sell them by the sack was their motto because you'd buy a whole a sack of, of burgers. So uh, Duncan for the little taverns model, he, he said he'd call them, buy them by the bag. So he not only stole all the, 
the uh, the uh, uh, the recipes and 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 the business model of White Castle. He even basically stole their slogan and and tweaked it for his own use. Uh, and the little tavern was was very successful. There were lots of little taverns, and they had um, in the early '30s. Uh, Duncan developed this distinctive uh, style for for the little tavern that was had this green. Um, sort of semi tudor like look to it, uh, but it had as metal panels, uh, um, uh, uh, glazed, white glazed uh, panels, but with green, green trim. And so a uh, very distinctive, very recognizable. And you can still see these buildings around the city. There were um, lots of them. I think there were, were something like, there were more than 50 of them in the area. Uh, when the chain reached its peak in the 1950s, and, uh, and then it, you know, it, it petered out. Um, it it lost its its charm. The originally, especially with the this white enameled look, when it when it uh, began in the 20s and 30s, this look uh, really convinced people of the cleanliness of the place. And this was a, a type. Uh, the white look was something that. That was done by a lot of restaurants. Obviously, White Castle, you know, White Tower is another chain that that did it. So, um, so they they looked quaint, but um, you know, over time, by by the mid twentieth century, really they they had a reputation for not being clean, um, fair or, or otherwise. That was the reputation, and uh, and of course, people called those little hamburgers death balls. So uh, um, things were not things were not going too well. And they they eventually petered out. Um, the last one, uh, the by the 1990s, they were gone out of D.C. The last one I, I understand uh, near Baltimore actually didn't close until 2008. But but anyway, they're all gone now, and uh, they have their other purposes. This one here in in Georgetown, um, as you can see, is is owned by Sweet Green. They have a market there now. They call it the Tavern after. In, in homage to Little Tavern, it's a it's a little little market. Um, another one, just one other I'll show. Here is a shot. Again, this is another. This is an old picture. It's out of date, uh, but this was actually uh, built late, 1963, uh, relatively late, um, and it is in the Union Market area on Moore Street. It it, it was. If you go there now, I think. Um, changes all the time. So I'm, I'm not uh, totally up to date on exactly what it looks like. But the last time I saw it, it was just a huge hole in the ground on this block where a new building is coming up. Now they're supposed to, uh, uh, agreement was reached that they're supposed to bring back the little tavern, uh, restore it to some degree and have it perched on the corner, um, sur surrounded by a looming office building up uh, or mixed use building all around it. So we'll see how that looks, but in any event, the the little tavern is supposed to uh, return in some form. Uh, and there are others here. I don't have uh, pictures of of other ones, but you can probably think of some. I, there are several of them. There was another one in Georgetown, even on on um, uh, Wisconsin Avenue, and uh, there's one on H Street Northeast. Uh, there are others around the city. You often have to look carefully, but if you look at if you if you notice that uh, the gabled roof um, and the and the size and shape of the building, you can you can recognize it as a former little tavern pretty easily. Uh, one other chain, a much smaller chain, uh, that was here in the past was the Toddle House chain, and here is a postcard of of the generic Toddle House. Uh, 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 restaurant design. And this is also a very little restaurant. It's like, like the little tavern model, tiny little place. Uh, inside, it was all stainless steel and, and, and a few bar stools, uh, ca or counter stools, and, and they serve burgers and such. Uh, but out on the outside, they uh, wanted to give this very homey, domestic, comforting look, like a little cottage. Uh, and all of them, all the toddle houses had the same look to them. And uh, they had, you'll see these two chimneys on either end to make them look really cute. Uh, a building this size uh, certainly would never have needed two fireplaces. 
Uh, but the fact is there weren't any fireplaces. These are both fake chimneys. There's no, there's no fireplace inside. And uh, there were a bunch of these around. There were um, in, in DC, there are um, uh, three former Tottle houses still in existence. And uh, one of them, and you may be thinking, you're looking at this building and you say, where have I seen that? And uh, one place is right here. This is, this is on Calvert Street in Adams Morgan. This is a former Tottle house. And it's now sitting on a, at a bus turnaround, originally a, a streetcar turnaround. And it's owned by WMATA. And they're, they're supposed to um, uh, renovate it a little bit and clean it up. Uh, but it's, it's, not, um, it's not a restaurant use. It still has that, that canopy there in front, even though they bricked up the front door. Um, and the, the fake chimneys are there. So uh, it's clearly a toddle house. Um, I have, I think I've got a photo, an historic photo. Yes, here it, here you can see it um, when it was a, a toddle house uh, with a streetcar going behind it and, a, and this articulated bus coming in front. Um, this is a photo from 1948. Uh, one of the others I'm gonna sort of finish up with this place I mentioned at the very beginning, uh, the, uh, the toddle house on Wisconsin Avenue in Tenley Town. Here you see it. <clears throat> uh, this is also a photo a few years back, but it's still there like this. Um, and this, this uh, it's a steak and egg kitchen. Now the chain, the Toddle House chain was sold in, um, in 1962 to a company called Dobbs House. And they turned most of the Toddle Houses into steak and egg kitchens, which was a, obviously was a chain. Um, this one is now is now the only one left. So it's a it's a chain restaurant with with no chain attached to it. And uh, it's been the same owners have had this since 1993. Um, and it's it's a, it's uh, again, the, the same format uh, as as the Toddle House was. And uh, it. Um, uh, it says, uh, according to the, the, the website for Steak and Egg, they say this, this dates to 1931. And if that's true, then uh, it's been continuously operating, uh, hasn't moved, uh, the name's changed, but we'll, we'll let them have that. So if it in, is indeed from 1931, then this would be a couple of years older even than Martin's. And so it would win the win the prize for all this continuously operating in one location. Uh, however, um, I'm withholding judgment on that um, because of this key piece of evidence I found. Um, here is an advertisement in the July 31, 1955 edition of the Evening Star that says, now open new ultra modern title house. So, and there's a picture of the place. Um, so I don't know what that means. Uh, it sounds like maybe the restaurant only dates to 1955. Maybe there was another one there previously and they built it and put in a new Tottle House building in 55. I don't know. It's an, it's an open question. So, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, so that's that. So uh, with that, um, that's, that's all I have tonight. I sort of wanted to fly through a bunch of different historic places and, and take you on a whirlwind tour of the city. And I didn't hit every, every uh, historic restaurant or building that had a historic restaurant, but hopefully you've got a flavor for, for some of it now. And uh, I think we may have uh, time for some questions. Yes, well, thank you so much, John. That was really wonderful. Uh, there's a lot here that I didn't know. So it was great to hear kind of all these interesting stories and. Um, I love the, the the sort of drama of some of these places, like the little tavern. <laughs> so, yes, yes, yeah. <laughs> it's great. There are a yeah. lot of stories, and there are, mm -hmm. there are many more too. I mean, there it, it's a, it's a lot to cover. Yeah, it is. So definitely incentive to purchase John's book, and um, you see it here. But then also, uh, I have I put a link into um, his page on Amazon where his other books are as well as as well as the Streets of Washington blog. Um, and the Historic Restaurants of Washington, D.C. Facebook, where John posts um, historic photos and facts about uh, all these amazing restaurants in the, in the district.
Um, so yes, we do have some time for questions. So let's see if anybody see here. Oh, okay. Elizabeth said, really interesting. I think I see Kate Smith on the cover of the book. Where does he get his photos? Ah, well, the, the photos come from many different places. Uh, that one there is, uh, yeah, that's at the uh, Capitol restaurant. And um, that photo is actually from the Library of Congress, which is a, a, a wonderful place to get photos. And they, they have a huge archive and many, many uh, DC uh, historic photos uh, from different collections. Um, the uh, big photographers in DC in the old days, uh, some of their collections have been given to the Library of Congress. So th they're really useful and I, I rely on them a lot. I also have photos um, that uh, I've got from different places. The cover has uh, photos, uh, some that I, I got from the restaurants themselves. Um, and uh, I also have, you know, you saw some postcards there. I, I collect the postcards and they're a great source of, of not just illustrations, but information about uh, commercial places in, in the city. Um, they really spark, uh, have sparked me to, to do a lot of the research I've done. So a lot of different sources for photos. Yes, we, we always appreciate our archives. <laughs> yes. We really get lost in them. <laughs> um, so we have a question from Lawrence. Uh, can you talk about the blue mirror, which was in your old Ebbett photo? Um, yeah, the blue mirror is is just uh, visible off, you know, cut off a little bit there. It was next to the to the old Ebbett. Um, that was there were two blue mirrors in in uh, uh, in Washington, and that was the blue mirror grill. There um, was was a very popular place. Um, and there was another blue mirror down uh, uh, further downtown um, that uh, eventually uh, uh, sort of drifted into the uh, the um, the less savory uh, type of place. Uh, they had strippers there in the back in the in the battle days when when strip joints were downtown. And um, I mentioned that only because the the blue mirror grill. Uh, next to the old Ebbett, uh, started to get uh, tarnished by by reputation just because it had the same name uh, when it was in fact a, a, just a nice little neighborhood grill. Um, mm. But it was it was there for a long time. That is funny. <laughs> Talking about one, but you really mean the other one. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's what. I don't know why, why people choose the same names for things, uh, and that we we saw that with the old Ebbett. Uh, they took took the Ebbett name, and then there was actually another uh, Ebbett Hotel. There was the 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 new Ebbett Hotel was on H Street uh, to add even further confusion to to that uh, to that uh, long standing uh, source of of, of confusion. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure they developed nicknames to hopefully try to. Uh, I, you know. I would think, yes, I would think, but I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm still waiting for some questions from the audience, but I guess I have a question. Um, you did all this wonderful research, John, and, and you shared a lot of great uh, restaurants with us. Um, so I guess which one or a couple of them, like which ones are your favorites or what did you particularly like to research about and, and, and learn about? Um, any... Yeah, sure. Yeah, so... Um... Yeah, there are a lot of great stories, and um, it's interesting to do uh, to to do history of restaurants because you're you know it's a little bit different. Pe people um, uh, want often ask me what's the best restaurant in town, and I'll say, well, I don't I don't know. There are a lot of good ones, and I'm you know I'm an historian actually. I'm not <laughs> a food critic, so. Um, so that's my strong suit is probably not in choosing based on food, but uh, based on stories, though, the the really most uh, uh, enlightening uh, subject for me was the story of tea rooms, because this is something I didn't really know anything about and had no idea that there was this whole uh, culture that developed in the 1910s and 20s of, of tea rooms uh, run by women that were almost it was a counterculture really uh, uh, of the day and these were places uh, where women could meet and feel comfortable 
and they, you know, they were successful businesses and they really, um, um, you know, uh, let, let the rest, regular restaurant business know how out of date they had become with their very restrictive policies and their very, you know, prudish and, 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 uh, and, and patronizing attitudes that, that existed in the day. Um, so, uh, so it was really great to learn about that and, and to see this tradition and the, the tea rooms, you know, it's interesting. They, they continued on till, till mid century or so when there were some, uh, some great places, uh, the, the Watergate Inn that uh, is a great one down where, the, where obviously where the Watergate is now. Um, and, and then they kind of died off. And then, you know, now we've got in the 1990s, teaism was a pioneer of sort of reviving uh, tea houses or tea rooms in the city. And now we have, a, we have a, we're flourishing with them new, a new generation of them. And they're different. They're not the same as the old ones, but um, it's just, I just found that a really uh, interesting um, little subgenre of the, of the restaurant business. Yeah, absolutely. Here. John and Holly ask, uh, do you have any thoughts about the long-term impact of the pandemic on DC restaurants? Uh, yeah, that's, you know, that's, that's a great question. And uh, I've, I've been asked that before. And, you know, I think about, you know, I mentioned the prohibition situation, and, and that's what comes to my mind is, uh, as in, in terms of an analogy to, to the pandemic, that's, that's the, the most um, uh, uh, analogous situation that we've had before in the past, where <clears throat> something has come along that really um, impacted the industry severely. And, um, and so the lesson from that was there was a lot of turnover, um, certainly, but there was, there was also, you know, once, once the, the bad part uh, was over, there was, there was some new energy. And, um, and I'm, I'm thinking that we're going to have something similar here. I don't, I don't think the pandemic in the end is going to be as bad, actually, uh, for the restaurant business as prohibition was. Uh, but certainly it's been very hard and, and some places have closed and every, every restaurant has suffered. Um, but, um, you know, the ones that are still here, um, I think there's going to be new energy uh, and we can, we're seeing some of that now. So, um, so I'm very hopeful. I don't think that, um, that uh, the business has been uh, crippled or, or, um, you know, devastated in any permanent way. I think, I think uh, it's going to bounce back. Yeah, and I think the community really did rally around a lot of these, um, a lot of these businesses. You know, doing the takeout still and and everything. So right, right, yeah. yes, really amazing support from 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 the community, and 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 it really points up the importance and of of restaurants as as community assets as as the, the glue of the community where people can come together and, and form relationships and have, you know, and make memories that they look back on. And they've all, people have always done that. And uh, it's always the social uh, qualities of a good restaurant and a, and a good maitre d' and a, and a good uh, uh, chef, all of that comes together um, and, and always has and, and, and still does. And uh, those are those are the places that are going to survive. Always are the ones that are going to survive. I think. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree. Uh, hold on, let me look into see if we have other questions. Oh, Peter asks: Are there any historic Washington restaurant recipes out there? <laughs> ah. Well, you know, I looked for some, I, I, and in, in the book, I do have a, a sampling of recipes from, from different restaurants. Um, so uh, I've got the, the rum bun recipe, the famous rum buns that everyone remembers from the seafood restaurants down in Southwest um, from Hogate's and, um, and the others. Uh, so I, I have a, a rum bun recipe. I've got some others. I have a recipe from the Iron Gate Inn 
um, and uh, and a few others. So they 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 can be found. Um, there, uh, it's it's uh, it's a little catch as catch can. Sometimes you know you go far enough back. Um, I I was looking at at recipes for oysters uh, from the 19th century, and uh, they get they get a little squirrely there. They get the ingredients are a little uh, uh, odd sometimes, and and the cooking techniques. So I'm not sure if uh, if you go too far back, you you may not want to. Uh, really uh, uh, sample some of those recipes, uh, but but it's very interesting. And yeah, the book has got a bunch of them. Yeah, Bill said um, the rum bun recipe is worth the price of the book. <laughs> so, <laughs> Glad to hear that, so yeah, I, I, I agree. I would do, I would, if I had to buy it, I'd get it for the rum bun <laughs> recipe. Um, uh, so Nancy asked, uh, so in referring to Ben's Chili Bowl, um, so the story that she always heard living in the neighborhood in the 1980s was that the reason they survived um, the 1968 um, disturbances was because they literally stayed open uh, through the immediate chaos, serving guardsmen and neighborhood people together as a safe space within its walls on New Street. Um, is this an urban legend or is this true? Yeah, no, I, I think that is absolutely true. Um, it, it, uh, you know, it was, it's, you know, in those times where, where it's chaotic and, 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 you know, and, and bad stuff is going around and people are kind of going crazy a little bit. It's, it's hard to, um, even if you're, you know, even if you're a good business owner, it, it can be tough and you could get a random um, um, Molotov cocktail through your window and your place is on fire. And, and even though you were, you were, uh, um, you know, uh, even though you supported the community and, and it, um, so it, it um, so some places, you know, sort of uh, suffered randomly. And I think it's definitely true that Ben's um, really actively got, was engaged with the people out there all the time uh, during the disturbances. Um, and that, uh, no question that helped, helped them survive. Um, and they they had you know in addition to the, to the basic reputation they had uh, of being a strong member of the community not being uh, an outsider the way uh, some businesses were perceived as being people from outside that had, that had come in and were and were just making money off of off of um, the the community and so uh, Ben's did not have that that reputation that definitely was a factor. Absolutely. Um, a lot of fans of the rum buns. Uh, Elizabeth yeah. said she forgot about them. She said this was great and just what we needed to get us thinking about eating out again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, those those seafood places are all gone. Um, so uh, I would have uh, um, included them if we had if we had anything. And of course, this, the Southwest waterfront is now in this whole new uh, incarnation, um, which is which is really fun. Um, but it does mean that that the historic stuff is all gone, and, and it's been gone twice over. The uh, the the original restaurants on the waterfront uh, from World War II and earlier were were uh, really historic. Uh, the original Hogate's was located in a former foundry. Um, in a, a very historic building uh, that had also been a foundry and it had been an aircraft uh, factory uh, for early, you know, when I'm talking about wood and, and, and cloth uh, airplane factory in the 20s. Um, so that was all, um, all torn down uh, for Southwest redevelopment in, this, in, the, in the 50s and 60s. And then, and then now we've got a new redevelopment along the waterfront there. So um, the historic stuff is gone, but but the rum bun recipe lives on. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. It lives on. <laughs> yes. Um, so Bill asked, um, where is the book available uh, for purchase? Uh, so it's um, it's around. Uh, it's, it's certainly available online, Amazon, and those kind of places. Uh, it's usually in um, in bookstores in the area. So um, it, you may have to ask for it, uh, but I've seen it. I've seen it in, in you know, the usual places uh, throughout around town. Mm -hmm. 
I will um I will put the link back into the chat, everyone. So you can just um you can click it and get and take it straight straight to it um on Amazon though. But there in the chat again. Um so I think we have one final question. Um so any thoughts about the and I'm probably gonna mess this up, but I'm sorry. The uh San Sui restaurant in Georgetown. Um, arguably one of the few really famous people places we've ever had and thanks uh, for all the memories and that is from Anne. Oh certainly yes um, yeah there there is uh, there's another whole strain of 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 uh, types of restaurants on the the uh, you know the the power lunch places and, and power dinner places so the sans souci uh, that she's asking mm -hmm. about uh, which uh, means without care, without worry in, in French. Uh, Sans Souci was actually um, on uh, 17th Street uh, downtown. And um, it was, it was, there was a, a, a wonderful collection of, of French restaurants. There was this renaissance of French restaurants in the 50s and 60s. And uh, particularly in DC in the early 60s, uh, really got a, a shot in the arm, the restaurant business uh, when JFK was president, because he really loved to go out to restaurants. I mentioned they liked the monocle, um, and he was, and he proposed to Jackie at Martin's Tavern. Um, but he also uh, went to places like Sans Souci or uh, Reeve Gauche in Georgetown, which was the um, opened in the fifties. That was right down, right there at the corner of of uh, Wisconsin and M. Um, and uh, Reeve Ghosh was uh, uh, a, a, um, a, a place that fostered a lot of French restaurants in the city and, and great French chefs uh, were brought there, got their start there and then opened restaurants um, like Pierre, uh, Leon d'Or, uh, um, I don't know, can't think of all the names, uh, but, but there was a, a whole bunch of them. And then the, the Sans Souci was, was famous uh, in particular, um, being it was on 17th Street is about a block away from the White House. So it was another power spot, particularly for White House folks. Um, and uh, uh, every, everyone talked about it. it uh, in its later years, um, McDonald's opened a, a, a McDonald's opened right next to it on, on 17th Street. And uh, I think that was, it was just infinitely embarrassing to have a McDonald's next to Sans Souci. Um, but uh, it, it um, and maybe that, maybe that uh, doomed it ultimately, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but it, yeah, it closed. I don't remember now when it closed. It must've been around 1980 or so, um, but it was, it's, its height was in the sixties and seventies. Um, and and for everybody, uh, put a link from the Washingtonian about how uh, Mick Jagger couldn't get a table there. So yeah, there's so there's a good dramatic read for you. <laughs> must must be good. <laughs> yeah, Mick Jagger can't even get a table. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much, John. Uh, we're we're you know we're gonna have to end here, but uh, thank you so much for you know giving us this tour. And uh, there's so much history. So definitely everybody I encourage you to, you know, purchase the book and, and follow um, John on social media and, and check out uh, his blog, uh, Streets of Washington. And again, I put